Okay, great. I'm Diana Molina, the an artist and the uh, exhibit curator for Icons and Symbols of the Borderland and the creative director for the Juntos Art Association. Uh, Alex, would you introduce yourself? My name is Alejandro Macias, but you can call me Alex. I'm a painter draftsman as part of Icons and Symbols of the Borderland. Um, and I teach painting and drawing. I'm an attendant track physician at the University of Arizona School of Art. And Angel, Cabrales. Uh, I am Angel Cabrales. Um, really happy to be part of Icons and Symbols. I am a multimedia uh, sculptor and I teach sculpture at uh, University of Texas at El Paso. Uh, I am an associate professor. So Alex and Angel are two of the artists that I recruited along the way with this exhibit. And the exhibit originally began in 2015. And it, um, as creative director for the Juntos Art Association, so a group of artists that have, have um, the, the organization began in the 1980s in order to respond to um, showing more of the diverse community in El Paso, Texas, uh, in the institutions having their work present and um, shown in the museums and galleries. So that's why the organization began. And I joined in 2011. And um, as I was um, considering the a type of uh, an exhibit to put together that would would reflect the variety of, of mediums and, and um, the, 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 uh, the diverse uh, work of, of the Juntos artists um, that the title Icons and Symbols of the Borderland uh, came up to me uh, because that, as a way to share the the story of our borderland environment with different voices and different um, perspectives. And then I went, you know, part of the process was visiting artist studios, calling artists that I knew to see if they had work that related to it. My own background had been in photography and writing creating feature stories uh, for magazines like Vogue, Mary Claire, um, El Decor, uh, National Geographic Traveler, and so just a variety of magazines cre creating reportage with photography and narrative. Um, here in the foreground, and a book titled Amsterdam Small town, big city, as I had lived there and, and worked there as well. Um, you will see on the left-hand side there below with the logo uh, for the exhibit, um, the catalog that was printed when we showed with City of San Antonio uh, in 2018, I believe it was. So the exhibit has been touring since it began in 2015 until now to different museums in Texas, New Mexico, and now the James Museum. Um, the word iconography comes from the Greek word image and to write. So our regional symbols contain elements that include the Mesoamerican, the Spanish, the Mexican, and the Native American influence all within the contemporary American cultural terrain and, and consumer trends. So it is um, that unique area and the, uh, the the different voices that are present in, in the border. It's the borderland story. Obviously, you know, it's a large, um, I would say, I refer to myself as a mestiza which is a mix, and that mix of representations. But in this story, it is 
telling our story through the images. And this is a, a, an image that's not in the exhibit, but it's a, a petroglyph by the Mimbres, um in Southern New Mexico with a Venus glyph. And this symbol is just, you know, so representative of our, what our path is, what we leave behind and such a perfect example of public art that has survived through the years. And, you know, while ours is, is an exhibit that's been touring for 10, 10 years, it's making an imprint and telling these stories. Um, a lot of my work is connected to collage. And um, so I will show a few examples of my collage work. Uh, this image uh, is in the El Paso Museum of Art collection at, and at, at the um, Blanton Museum collection in Austin, Texas. And it is a self-portrait that I worked on with my mother, um, just taking objects and, and um, you know, one, one of my first, the first camera I used professionally. Um, you'll see a corner of the, of the map there that shows the El Paso, uh, the Texas, New Mexico, and Chihuahua, uh, Mexico border. Um, so that's part of the collage too but just piecing these different images, different stories. And another image of the uh, Radamuri, the, um, the indigenous runners from Chihuahua that are renowned for running um, ultra marathons. So this is um, one of the runners there from that area. Here's a piece by uh, Cesar Martinez. I, I um, recruited, I'm going to say about three quarters of, of the, the uh, artist in the exhibit are new that, um, and, and Alex that I met and, and uh, liked their work. And we'll go further into how we brought, brought in their work. But this is um, a piece very tied to identity in through the uh, bull here represented, uh, representing the old world and, and Spain, and then with the Jaguar, the Americas, and that blend. Here's a piece I'm going to uh, just touch on by, by Alex. And Alex, you can certainly speak about it right now, but you do have more image in that it it is speaking to identity through this representation of a, a man painted like a serape, a tapestry. But you know, it directly speaks to how do we communicate, how do we better communicate our borderland identity and experience as an extension to the land we inhabit. This is go, goes through the um, through the entire exhibit. And here it is represented with you know, the colors of the flag and the American flag, and yet the colors also of the Mexican flag. And how does a historically marginalized community approach the institutions and structures that are meant to service? So part of the goal in this exhibit is, is telling these stories from different viewpoints, but also um, tackling um, this very controversial border area that is, is so important in the, in the national conversation as creatively as possible. Alex, would you like to speak a little bit about your piece at this time? Yeah, well, a lot of, and you'll see further on into the, the presentation that I've frequently visited the Serape, which is a Mexican Mexican textile design. And I'm I'm a second generation Mexican American and I was born and raised in the borderlands, which also is a an homage to my own mentor, uh, who was born in Mexico City and lived in the Rio Grande Valley, Valley which is in South Texas on along alongside the borderlands. And so I've frequently visited the Serape because he used it himself. But in, in this case, I used it as 
frequently as like an archetype of, of someone who is of Mexican descent. And so I, the Serape is usually in a silhouette um, and it is supposed to reinforce this fa the fact that it is someone of Mexican descent. They could be Mexican or Mexican-American, um, variety of generations. Um, but when I made this work, I found my, a lot of the work actually stems from the 2016 president, presidential election. I felt it was a, a uh, I've never lived in, in at least in the, during my life, my, my lifespan had seen such a political divide among people that I was surrounded by. And then obviously nationally, that was a huge uh, talking issue during the time. And so when I, I had, I think I had just, I was literally wearing that shirt. It was like a hybrid. Uh, and again, I talked, we, the word iconography has already been used. And so the, I mean, what's more iconic than an, an American flag, right? But then it has the the Mexican colors like also embedded into it. So this there's this kind of hybridity going on with this sort of iconography. And Brownsville is like about 95% Mexican and Mexican-American. So it is like, there is this kind of like balance between nationality, but also with your ethnic background, um, uh, specifically deal dealing with your own Mexican heritage. And so it is encompassing all these like different viewpoints and di these different lived experiences dealing with heritage and nationality, but also understanding like, um, I think voting is obviously the right choice to do if you're trying to create a pathway for your community that's best suited for your community and for future generations that follow. So obviously like when I vote, I don't have children yet, but when I do hopefully have children at some point, my right to vote creates a pathway for my children and the community that, that, uh, that, that I'm embedded with. So in this case, I am, when I voted, I was still living in Texas and in Brownsville. So that was all those like issues were like, revolving around my head at the moment that I was making this work. And I, and I understood that, uh, there was probably a, a much like this last one, a, a, uh, an election that was incredibly, incredibly pivotal for my own future and the many people around me. And so I, I recognized that at that, at that time. And so, um, that's why I made it. It looks like we have a question. Oh, shoot, do you have a question? Go ahead and, and share your question. Yeah, I'm kind of curious. Uh, uh, Alice Omega is, is uh, an archetypal figure. And um, how come you make it is a faceless? Yeah, so What's I- What's the choice in make it a faceless? Uh -huh. Yeah, so the I frequently use my own silhouette, but it doesn't, I think at some point it necessarily doesn't even feel like me. Um, although I'm making the image, I think it, again, it, it becomes uh, a placeholder, right. Of someone of Mexican descent. So many people like me who are a uh, first and first generation, second generation, and also like who have also assimilated into the United States, right. Who will come from a Mexican background. So that frequently I'm, I'm doing some portraits constantly, but also I think they can be interpreted as someone of Mexican descent. So that's why the Serape design is, is implemented into a particular silhouette, but there aren't any distingu distinguishable facial features, if that makes sense. I hope you hope I answered your question. Well, thank you. Thank you for the uh, question and, and uh, elaboration, Alex. I think it's such a powerful piece as the vote is, is uh, so critical to you know, participating and and whether we have children or not, you know, determining our outcomes and future. Um, here by Richard Armendariz, only time will tell whether a river runs through heaven or hell. And it depicts one of the original members, uh, Luis Jimenez, who was one of the um, founding, one of the first members of the Juntos Art Association in the 80s. And Ricky Armendariz uh, 
was um, close to him as, as some of the artists in the group were, were. And this is a woodcut that depicts his life and times and his art and, and uh, the environment in which he, he um, lived in, in the uh, Southwest, New Mexico. And another piece by uh, Richard Armendariz with that's also a woodcut. This is off. The, um, this one is in, is in the exhibit. Another point I want to make is, as the exhibit um, has traveled, it's also um, expanding, has expanded. It evolves um, and adapts according to the museum that it is showing in. So some pieces, some works. Um, are sold and are no longer in the show. Some are new that we bring in. And um, so that that is a, a key point of the exhibit as, as it, um, in its evolution. Um, we always look to uh, show for approximately six months with, with, every, um, with every venue. And um, I always request for as much space uh, as possible to be given to the to the exhibit as there's always uh, plenty of art to fill it. So this is um, also um, a quote from from Ricky here. Animals are fl fleeing an unseen danger and carrying a knowledge with them as represented by the burning stick in the mouth of the coyote coyote. And it represents a representation of gods and goddesses taking the form of animals in Roman and Greek mythology, as well as pre-Columbian and Mesoamerican art. Uh, Ricky uh, is from the El Paso region, or from, from El Paso, born and raised, and is now a professor of art at um, University of Texas in San Antonio. And the next piece is, is also depicting the desert, a walk in the desert by Antonio Castro. And he um, also represents one of his, um, his, his role, his, well, his key role model who he ended up uh, even growing a mustache like him. But the, the desert environment, the snake, which represents transformation, the timepiece, and, and other symbols. Uh, this one is, is very unique, Chicanix by Roberto Salas. And um, it refers to the vernacular and colloquialisms of Chicano and Chicano culture and its evolving dualities in neon. So these are you know, very unique terms to the border area. And as it ties to symbolic memory and words that we're familiar uh, with also ties to that collective conscious. And this piece is um, Repujado, which is metal embossing uh, by Romy Hawkins. And it is a type of art that is very traditional with roots in Mexico where she is from originally. And um, so that's that's part of the mix and bringing the bodies of the, the different artists and artworks together is, is um, while this is traditional, it is a contemporary, um, contempor contemporary depiction with um, an age old traditional uh, technique. And then we have more uh, abstract contemporary. This is by Tina Fuentes. And it is Nube Colorada Turbulenta, which is, is a turbulent red cloud. And she collaborated with the um, uh, a scientist in the project for a body of work. And then we had some of those pieces in, in the show. Here's another one, clouds and rain is what Nubes y Lluvia translates to. So the four sections to the um, exhibit are the environment, which is um, 
that's what brings us all together. That's what makes it, that's the shared space that, um, that ties all of the artists in this exhibit and in, in the works. Um, so that is the, uh, we give more space to that section, to the environment as it ties, ties everyone together. As in this piece, um, it's an abstract by Wopohala depicting the Rio Grande River as it begins in Colorado and goes to the more southern arid parts of Colorado and then to northern and southern New Mexico, then to the Big Bend in Texas and to the Rio Grande Valley where it feeds into the Gulf. So this is a, a very large piece, and while it does not show humanity, it, it uh, certainly shows the, the impact of humanity as we are um, this year more than ever. The, not only with the, the hottest time, um, the hottest temperatures that we've had, and the impact of, of drought from lack of rainfall, in the deserts and feeding the, the Rio Grande River, but um, so much of the evaporation that is taking place. And this is so important as the, the river is our lifeblood. So it is a, a very important piece in the exhibit. And, and that's what we you know, aim to, to address is, is what are, you know, not only through our identity, but what is relevant to our, our lives as a as a border community, regardless of, of race and background. Uh, Oscar Moya was just uh, at the James Museum uh, last last. Uh, it was Friday and Saturday, presenting um, his work from the Maquila Blues series, and he and his partner Lydia Limas also gave a, a printmaking workshop, but. This is, and, and Oscar Moya was, um, has been a long time member of the group. So he was one of the, the members when I joined the group. And, you know, as, as art organizations change and, and, you know, some art organizations are, are, you know, very challenging as it is because artists are such, such individuals, but, um, it is that lasting power of staying with the group and, and continuing that has been so um, important to this show and the continued contrib contributions. Um, so Coro Diamondstein here brings with Pancho Villa and La Frontera um, a historic photograph by her grandfather who uh, took the pictures during the Mexican Revolution and then later um, painted them, you know, hand painted them and gave them a different, a, a new life, so to speak. Um, here's another piece uh, by, um, by Oscar Moya, uh, border, Borderline, that addresses it, that, that features the, um, a lot of the manufacturing and twin plants there that that um, encompass the border with with industry going products produced in Mexico and in the US um, for the the uh, regional and national and international markets actually but he also incorporates the uh, a lot of the plant life the daturas barrel cactus and dramatic sunsets this is another collage of mine. Um, the piece is also called Borderline. And of course, um, in, the, in the dialogue, in, the, in, in all communication and concerns about the border, the wall is, is, a, um, is so key to the conversation. And in my lifetime, I have um, you know, witnessed very little very little border wall at, at the beginning of my life and a lot of, of back and forth between Mexico with 
with EC. Um, oh, I, I'd just say, you know, e easy commutes back and forth and for shopping and trade. And this, this image here it was, was created as the buildup began um, back in 2005, actually. And I just took different photographs. Some of the, the pieces, some of the slices are from Vietnam landing mat that they was recycled um, from that, that war and, and brought back and utilize, utilized as wall. But then some of the stronger beams then then that which is cutting the the ocean there in the San Diego area. Um, here's another work by Antonio Castro that um, was intended as a counter statement to the fear based messaging as immigrants, both legal and undocumented, are much less likely to commit crimes. And that was by a study from the Cato Institute. And, you know, one of one of the um, one of the issues right now is is the farm workers and this. It, it's believed by the federal government that over 50% of the farm workers that provide our food uh, are undocumented. But during COVID, it has been, you know, other sources like the, the uh, farm workers of America, farm workers, the United Farm Workers, um, have stated that it's closer to 70 to 80%. Because people, American citizens, do not want the work. And, you know, mass deportation that may include farm workers, would certainly include farm workers, will also raise prices. These are all considerations as we look at, you know, the, the critical border issues. Some of it, you know, some along with environment. The other is the frontera borderland infrastructure. This is another piece by Antonio Castro that shows the, um, it's called Rebirth and shows um, the dark clouds and yet the light and the bullet casings there on the dry river. Rebirth. Mark Clark takes a satirical viewpoint with a lot of his, his work. He actually lived right on the border in Brownsville for for many, many years. This piece is co called Olin, and it incorporates the Aztec glyph for motion and movement in the layered depiction of the wall. Um, and then the, great, the gateway bridge crossing and the river and La Bestia that carries many immigrants on, on the train. Um, but a very, very colorful, vibrant piece that you have to look at the details of to see. Here's some, another um, vibrant piece, Greetings from La Frontera, where he shows um, the, the borderland pinup gal uh, waving at the border patrol while um, people are crossing the river and climbing the wall. Gina Gwen Palacios is another artist that, um, and, and, you know, in speaking to how these, the project evolves and takes shape, um, you know, I, I met Alex um, at an exhibit and he'd seen the exhibit in Austin, but we crossed paths at the uh, San Antonio Museum of Art. And then that led to him visiting the show again when it was in San Antonio. And then he was as a board member for the Brownsville Museum of Art and a professor at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, um, was instrumental in the exhibit going to Brownsville. And uh, so that led to, to that connection. And he was um, just such an important part of, of that, uh, 
opportunity. And then he joined the group formally and the exhibit went to the Amarillo Museum of Art after that. And Alejandro has been showing since then. But going to Gina Gwen Palacios, Alex had already moved to, to um, teach in, in Tucson and living in Arizona. Uh, but he'd gone back and, and had dinner at a mutual friend's house where Gina Gwen Palacios, who took his place, um, at the Rio Grande Valley, um, also joined the group. And this work is so unique. There's a piece in the show that uh, elaborates on this one that is called Cotton, um, Cotton Kids. And in this case, it is her father and her aunt and the materials she uses in the depiction is actually cotton and cardboard. So that's another aspect of this exhibit is using a, a variety of, of materials. Um, Cesar Martinez has a piece using barbed wire. Um, and here's a, another instance by Davinia Mirabal. Uh, this piece is called Living the Dream and she creates it from repurposed paper, daily paper that she's using. And um, whether daily receipts or tech stubs. Um, so very, very interesting in, in that story. And you said another, and here another depiction of, of, uh, of the female figure. This is called Wild Breaker by Antonio Castro. And he often depicts um, his um, himself in his portraits or uh, members of his family. And this is his daughter-in-law. And Miracielos, this is looking at the, at the skies. And it's by Jose Rivera Barrera. He works with mesquite wood. So that is symbolic in itself by the durability and um, symbolism that that uh, it represents in in the borderland, the the uh, how shall I say the the you know the those trees adapt to lack of water at, to an extreme extreme lack of water and continue surviving and providing providing food as well. The other uh, section is food and drink. And this is another piece by Oscar Moya that depicts a, a roadside um, roadside um, market here selling avocados and mangos and with the, uh, the Texas uh, Franklin Mountains behind them. And Lydia Limas uh, takes the, um, the prickly pear and incorporates it here as a, as a popular Mexican toy, border toy. Uh, here, Mark Clark takes, again, with a satirical approach in the portrayal of consumption on the streets and plazas fronteriza. Uh, Mark Clark was, uh, had been a part of the El Paso Water Biennial, and that's how I met him and brought, invited him in the group. Um, while the group was El Paso based when I joined it, I just thought it would be um, so important to expand the membership to um, have that, that broader, um, more, more complete depiction of the border and the border experience. So um, these are, you know, most of most of the artists are new to the group here. Victoria Sweskum, I visited her studio in um, in San Antonio, and uh, she has her her specialty are food signs, primarily depicting um, signs that she sees, colorful signs that she sees advertising. Um, 
for restaurants and all the advertising that goes painted on on murals, painted on walls of of, of restaurants and cafes. Here, a fruit cocktail and uh, and uh, a paleta, and ice cream. The other section is uh, the sacred and profane. The sacred and profane includes. The Mona Lupe here by um, the epitome of Chicano art by Cesar Martinez. He has um, recent, be, recently been uh, called the um, uh, a Chicano art pioneer uh, by the San Antonio Express News as he has an exhibit currently uh, in San Antonio and has been um, an important part of, of the uh, in the American art scene, I would say, through his depictions of uh, different series. And then here he takes the, the blend from Europe and Mexico again through the Virgin of Guadalupe with the Mona Lisa and the venerated Virgin of Guadalupe. Uh, there's also the traditional um, retablo from the New Mexico and Mexico borderlands here by Chris Rijalba Garcia um, using the traditional piece in, in this story as it is also continued part of the borderland story. And Gaspar Enriquez from um, the El Paso, Texas area. He um, this is a piece called Carrying the Past in um, airbrush and depicting the Maya past of the uh, woman depicted. Um, now I'll speak briefly about my um, collages. I work with uh, paper collage here. You, you saw photographic collages before, but I take um, repurposed paper and this is depicts, depicting the Mesa Vista, which is the the area with one of the areas that I I live in and frequent. Um, here is a piece and a piece that um, takes inspiration from the Diamondback Rattler that I uh, cross as I walk the desert. You can see the the barcodes of the underbelly of the snake. Um, and I call my works, you know, and it's a, a contemporary serape. And the serape, again, is a, a shawl or blanket worn and used in Latin America, Mexico, and the U.S.-Mexico borderland. It's essentially it's a tapestry, um, but I am using um, commercial discarded papers um, as my palette that I... Um, you know, have an idea. I I um, collect the the uh, different um, papers and my stashes that that uh, people save for me and send me, and that I consume myself. And then lay out the the design, lay it, cut it out. It's essentially cut and paste. In this case, with the agave, um, it was going to be a horizontal piece, but as I was creating the work it kept growing so then it uh, became a vertical piece and there i am at work these are this is the dosekis um that i was working on there and the heart this is also in the exhibit and then this is a new material, or not an, actually an old material that was salvaged with old piano keys. And during COVID, um, I well, I had I had uh, had these old piano keys, and I always envisioned wings for them. I envisioned them as wings, and I literally drove them to the dump one one day. But I just couldn't let go and, and uh, brought them back home and, and just waited for the right time. So as it happened uh, during COVID, I reached out to 
Angel Cabrales, again, the, the um, head of the sculpture department at UT El Paso. And we collaborated to, to make these, these, uh, the song on the wings of debris as an homage to all that we, all those many that, to commemorate the many that we had lost um, and just that that very uh, challenging time period and and um, going going forward um, in, into the into the future with an um, with a more positive outlook. But because of the you know angels and engineering um, background as well, this took shape and, and now I'd like to pass it over to Angel to speak about this piece and the the next one in the exhibit. Okay. Hi. <laughs> uh, so this was really great. Uh, Diana had these amazing keys and we were talking about what we could do with them. We were talking about how she had this this title of Song of the Wings of Debris and she wanted angel wings, which uh fit with me very well. Um, not just because of my name, but I, I, I loved the idea of it. And so I had to design a pattern first of how I wanted the wing, the, the keys to be cut, to be formed into their, their pattern. And so I drew everything out first and then laser cut the pattern into some steel. So then I could make a template uh, to make the, the wing pattern. And then from there, taking each and every uh, key, uh, we had to, I had to cut them into each shape, sand them into, into their forms to place them into the, that, that section. And then of course we wanted it so that people could stand in front of them and be able to have those, that, those wings to be able to pretty much rise up out of that, that debris, right? Um, so I, I needed to make sure that it was at a certain height um, that could accommodate people of all sizes. Um, so, but, but all of it was done with, with a scrap metal as well. Cause I, I thought it, I, it would be fitting to use it that way since the keys themselves were also salvaged. So. And it's very popular at, at the, uh, exhibits. People love to, um, stand in front of it and, have their picture taken and and uh, it's you know an, a very interactive piece as well beginning with beginning with the materials that were that were provided by a, an old friend of mine who was ready to throw them out so <laughs> <laughs> and now we'll go to well, the next hold on. Piece. I think I think Shu had a, a question oh okay go ahead Shu yeah, I think this is a really very uh, sex, very creative piece. Not just because people can, just like you, you have picture, photograph taken as you in the middle. But I also like uh, the way how you know, the title also, that the texture, also the color, the in terms of form, the color, it all goes, it, it matches very, very well. Particularly you have, you have this, this um, brown and then uh, go out, uh, you have the, this uh, black and white. It come, it's just that people can remember that's normally a fellow, can, the you know, color they can see in the fellers. So that's really great, very good, wonderful job uh, have the kind of great creativity had done with this piece. Congratulations. Then one day it's popular. <laughs> thank yeah, you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was. And, and then considering the circumstances and at the and the time in which it was built, but it ties to um to a saying, uh, some more uh, uh, just some words that I always remember in lowest points, and it says, on on the on the debris on the debris of our despair we build our character and you know there are just different times I would say you know through through the hurricane you all have just been the hurricanes you've been going through and that challenge and you know just must have the despair you all have 
had to go through and you know we build character in those lowest points so that that uh is tied to that those words as well okay angel if you'd like to speak to the other piece uh so 225 and counting um i made uh in august of 2017 and uh I've I've retouched it a, a few times as as time's gone through, um, but it 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 was really hard hitting for me, especially after um in twenty nineteen, uh when when we had the the shooting in El Paso, uh but two twenty five and counting was finished on August tenth twenty seventeen, and on that day uh, I looked up to see how many mass shootings we had had. Uh, in the country, and we'd had already had 225 mass shootings on that day, which was more mass shootings than there were days in the year already. Um, and it's unfortunate because this trend doesn't stop. Uh, you can look it up, and every year we have more mass shootings than there are days in the year. And it's it's heartbreaking. And it's heartbreaking because nothing nothing's really done about it. Um, and, and so I wanted to show this, this infinite amount of, of, of mass shootings that are being done by a gun that <laughs> really shouldn't be out in the public. Um, there's no reason for it, but, you know, I'm not against our second amendment rights, but at the same time, I think we need to think sanely of, of what we're doing out, out there in the world and what we're putting out in the world. Um, so I made this piece about that. And once, once the, once it happened in El Paso, it, it hurt even more. And I, I actually, I couldn't bring myself to make another piece about mass shootings for a while um, because it hit so hard in our area. Um, but I thought this was also very important to show out in Florida because just the, every single state I think has this this problem um, as well. Uh, but it is neon. It is an infinity mirror. Uh, the neon tubes are two neon tubes, uh, two four foot neon tubes that are welded together and pumped with uh, neon gas inside. And then it's encased in a metal case with uh, two two way mirrors so that when you look at it from either side, you see an infinite amount of guns going on forever. So. And I, I would like to add, you know, in, um, in the protection of our, our families, of ourselves, of our society, um, you know, how can it be that children are dying I mean, the 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 greatest uh, cause of death for children guns. is from guns. Yeah, it's from guns. I mean, this was not the case when we were growing up, but this is part of these you know these weapons of mass destruction that were not intended, um, were never intended for for use in everyday. Everyday, everyday life and community. I mean, they have no place in, in. I'm of that strong opinion. It's just causing too much destruction, and and and. Well, um, and that's one of the reasons why I made it that it's you can look at it from both sides because it doesn't matter which side you're on. Nothing is going is is happening. Nothing is changing, and it continues to go on. And that's why it's double sided. Side note, I don't know if I ever told you this, Angel, but when I was moving from Texas to Arizona, <clears throat> I was in El Paso the day of the shooting, and I was moving to Tucson, because Tucson's mm -hmm. only four miles away from El Paso. Yeah. So I was, on that day, the mass shooting had already happened at Walmart, and it was just crazy that I was able to kind of witness all the cars, the cop cars, like, parked outside of the, the side of the freeway. 
just shocking to be able to kind of see that on the day of, you know. Yeah. You know, that's that's the the crazy thing was I was actually in Phoenix that day. Um, I was actually about to head back home and I started getting calls from friends left and right asking me if I was okay. Um, I got friends, I got a call from a friend who was at Walmart and she told, she told me she was okay. I was really grateful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, and it, 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 the, the amount of helplessness you feel, you know, even from that distance or even while you were there, it's just, it's, it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. But I mean, well, we, lost, we lost to the 20, I mean, 23 people that day, 23 people in that massacre in El Paso. And it is not something that just, you know, impacts the border, but it is a, a, a national crisis. Well, the worst thing about it, I think that, I mean, it's tragic that we lost the 23 people, but even more so is the after effects that happened. Um, El Paso was the safest city in the country. And after that moment, gun sales in El Paso skyrocketed. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And and you know, and and the um, the danger of of false rhetoric as well. Yeah. You know that that hatred of of immigrants and and um, the the. Uh, What's that that othering of people that you know? The othering, yeah. We yeah. need to find a, a, an enemy to push all of our our fears onto. It just and it continues to happen. It's still happening today, you know. And it's it's just how do we how do we move past it? And how do we deal with the next four years? Uh, very, and, and, and uh, above all, how how do we how do we legislate for safe safe gun use? You know as well. Mm -hmm. Any any more to add to this? Um, no, I think I'm okay. Okay, thank you, Angel. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we'll move to. Um, Alex and um, he'll speak again about two more two pieces in the show and then one that's in the book and so Alex please uh, share your perspectives here yeah I'll, I'll mention briefly about <laughs> some of the work included in the show and then like a general overview and I'll do that uh, kind of briefly but <clears throat> just also like um, when I was included in icons and symbols i was thinking about the particular divisions within within the the show and then like food always was something in my mind even when i moved here in arizona when it comes to south texas and i at the time I, when i made the drawing it was still living in texas and <clears throat> and uh but something that I, I can't help but go back into my early 20s and also this work, work is very different from anything that i've done and intentionally, because I felt like manipulating my facial features and and to a, a, a more exaggerated degree was necessary to get that kind of feeling across. And so again, like going back to Brownsville, it's um, it's about like again like around ninety five, close to about at that amount Mexican and Mexican American. So we have like countless taquerias scattered around Brownsville. And in fact, uh, nothing against Tucson, but I haven't been able to find a taco to the, the same degree of of that quality for me. And I mean, I grew up eating them, right? But um, it goes back to even my, it's, it's a self-portrait obviously, but it goes back to my experience even in the early twenties. And the title is, it, it kind of like connects to that is like, you know, I would hang out with my friends and, and family and go to bars um, and then they close at 2 a.m. And then where else is, can I eat at that point? And the only places that were open were Whataburger. I'm not sure if they have it in Florida. But, and taquerias and like taco spots. And so like, I mean, they were like infested with people past 2 a.m. Um, 
And so my intention was to create a kind of like Robert Crumb type of illustration that kind of grasped the, the particular moment that I was in this moment of ecstasy, eating tacos in a drunken state, like back in Brownsville. And I, and I think everyone in Brownsville is very much in tune with this particular feeling because again, like anything that's open is, I mean, the likelihood of eating something at past 2 a.m., it, uh, it'll most likely be tacos. So it was it was just a particular taqueria that I was interested in. Um, and, and at that moment, it was Ultimo Taco in Brownsville. And so I actually am referencing that particular moment. You can go to the next slide. Well, let me let me show you this. Yeah. Um, the 50 best tacos in Texas. <laughs> oh, you might be interested in this. I, I in will. The, the, um, this month's issue of Texas Monthly. Uh, Republic of Tacos. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's such a culturally, I mean, icon also, right? Tacos are culturally. Oh, right. And it, right. they've kind of like expanded across the U.S., but also it's been like reinvented or it's been like re redesigned. Um, and, and, but it's, I mean, I mean, to eat a taco from Brazil or El Paso or any, anywhere in the border is about as authentic as, as it can get without having to go to Mexico. Right. And so, um, I mean, I've never tasted anything quite like it. Like I've, and I still search for it today. Like I, I can't, I can't quite find the same particular Tucson is about 70 miles North of the border. If I go near the border, I'll find something closer to it, but it is crazy how I obviously like the further distant I become from the border that on um, this authenticity, it, it, it kind of disappears. Right. And so I, 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 I re really kind of brought my time and my time living in Brownsville, eating tacos. Arizona made me sad when I was going to school out there when it came to tacos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would say, I would argue that Phoenix has better tacos than Tucson though. Oh, I mean, I've been really, there. yeah. I've been oh, able to find a better quality taco in Phoenix than I have been in Tucson. And nothing in Tucson tacos, but I, the Phoenix ones have, <laughs> have been better for me. Well, it, it, it certainly attests to the fact that, that you know, the the uh, food and drink is is uh, goes straight to the heart of, of mm -hmm. icons and symbols. You know? well, one of the great things is in, in, that in the top 10 of those best tacos in Texas, South Texas and El Paso are in the top 10. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Now we go back to. <laughs> um, <laughs> in a different hand up. Yeah. So I, again, going back to some of the things that I said earlier, um, my mentor was a, a, a huge influence in the, in the direction that I would go in the future. And I was always kind of like struck by his like social and political awareness and and I, the first time I ever heard the word Chicano was through him. And like Chicano essentially means like Mexican American, right? And so he was very proud of his heritage, his, his ethnic background, um, also was an immigrant from Mexico City. And so like living in Brownsville, we are products of migration. Like the generally everyone that I'm surrounded is either undocumented, first generation or second generation. Uh, and most generations, as they get further, they most likely leave. And so it's, it is a, a very kind of prominent culture in in Brownsville. However, I again, my mentor died in 2016, and um, and it's um, his impact just was um, after death was just like, um, I mean, I can't even describe it. It was like monumental, and and so. Uh, I started recognizing the, the 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 symbols and the the content of the work uh, much more profoundly. It was like really resonating with me. And then what what happened was I was finally starting to find my footing as an artist. I was like, I was aesthetically finding the things that I was interested in. I was able to render my figures much more accurately, and so I had more control of my my medium. And so then, and then, so it was a combination of these things. And then 
the presidential election happened in 2016. And so I was hearing a lot of rhetoric about, it wasn't even just necessarily Mexicans, but a, many groups of people. And so I, I was interested in the, how that kind of rhetoric echoed beyond, not only in the border, but beyond. And so I felt this sense of urgency. It's like, oh, I have to, you know, I was always hesitating about being, making work about that was socially and politically charged because I was like, well, everyone from Brownsville was making work about border topics. It's not until I started getting more recognition for my work and I started traveling that I realized like, oh, a lot of people outside the border don't really necessarily understand what's happening on the border. And so that that caused a shift in my, in the direction uh, and uh, aesthetically, but also content wise. And so I used the Serape again, which is a, a tapestry and it's a Mexican textile design again, as a, as a sort of placeholder of someone of Mexican descent. Living in Brownsville, I, I felt it. I felt a political and social divide among people that were even family members. And so I consider myself kind of like a documentarian of sorts, right? And much like Cesar Martinez, who was obviously a very huge influence in my work as well, he singles out a figure um, and he did it. He did arc, work that was also addressing the archetype, a type of person that he would see, but not necessarily a specific person. Um, so he was bar borrowing a lot of like qualities from a variety of people and creating this kind of like composite of, of a person that seemed familiar to you. And so again, like a lot of these don't have necessarily facial features, but they could be the symbol of somebody. And so what I was seeing during 2016, I was seeing a lot of Trump supporters who were of Mexican descent. And so I thought that was an interesting dichotomy to me who, of someone who is a product of migration when there is some really strong immigration focal points that are being emphasized within the, the election, like during the election. And so I, I saw this particular, like for me, what felt like a contradiction. And then even people who are like documented who are criticizing even undocumented family members. I mean, you see that even right now, even more strongly, I would argue, than it was back in 2016. So I was, I I've been very interested in, in the character of people, their social and political allegiances, um, and and this uh, and this conflict, and an internal conflict, this moral dilemma, um, and and how do you even if you let's say you have a family member, how do you kind of justify this thought process um, when you yourself are supporting someone who is clearly talking about deportation? Um, and and so that became the one on the left became the very first one that I had. Oh, done. Sorry. No, that's fine. You can move on to the next okay. that utilized the set up a textile design. Right. And so it became like a way, a vehicle in 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 the way I can talk about identity, uh, uh, you know, dealing with national allegiances, but also dealing with eth eth ethnicity and heritage and allegiance allegiances to your to your background and to your roots. Um, and in this case, I made a different one. But I changed the. I made I I wanted to make it more positive. So I. I changed the wording, right? And this is also referencing a real hat. Like I started seeing the 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 structure of the slogans being changed and reinterpreted and recontextualized to say, oh, immigrants make America great. And this country is built on migration. I mean, it is, I mean, it doesn't even really even is rooted to Mexican necessarily or Latino or, or anyone from Latin America. We are a mixture of immigrants and this is this is why this country has been able to prosper, because we have all different walks of life from all different places and different lived experiences, and we're able to make this country succeed. Um, and so that's why I made this uh, this one. You can move to the next one. Citizen again, um, it reinforces this idea of of the power we hold as citizens, American citizens, despite no matter. Uh, if we come from a, a different cultural background, I speak from it from a Mexican American lens. However, I understand that the, the power we hold as as American citizens, we get to dictate our own futures. Um, and again, um, uh, Diana and I were in conversation about um, 
creating the first one that I was in in the first in this first uh, section of the PowerPoint is a much much smaller uh, painting. It's like twenty by sixteen, and so me and Diana were in conversation about making a larger one. So I made a larger one specifically for the James Museum. So this is the the, the introduction of this particular painting um, in in at the James Museum. You can go to the next one. Uh, I recently had a show in New York City, um, and then a lot of it, it responds to. I was, I was, I do a lot of self portraiture again, dealing with my own Mexican American identity, um, in in critiquing and my own assimilation into American society. I grew up speaking Spanish. You know, I came from a generally pretty traditional background, Mexican background, very religious. My mom is still very religious, and so. Um, but there was always conflict about the type of person I should be. I understand like as for uh, generations further assimilate, there's this, what I would say argue is uh, this type of erasure, this cultural and ethnic erasure happening uh, within um, communities. Right. And so I was, I, I've done a lot of self portraiture, but I got to a point where like, um, well, you know, I want to do something outside of myself. And so I was interested in, in, I, and Angel maybe can comment on this as well because he he does a lot of work responding to the militarization of the border, right? It's heavily militarized, a lot of border patrol agents. Um, every generally, like in Brownsville, the border patrol agents that you see are Mexican, are of Mexican descent, and so this is why again the i'm interested in the the silhouette because it becomes a placeholder for a particular type of person and in this case it's of someone of mexican descent so you are seeing uh people who are mexican deporting <laughs> or seeing the horrific realities done to other mexicans and the of people from latin america who are migrating migrating into the united states and so i'm interested in this kind of moral dilemma um, what's happening within are you able to suppress the the certain horrific realities that you're seeing uh the the the, the tension of of latinos latinas um and then seeing their suffering on a daily basis uh and then how do you justify living that but i'm also empathetic i i think that's why i'm a teacher because i'm empathetic and i can understand that uh, opportunity along the borderlands is limited. And so a lot of people are, again, only are, are trying to um, provide not only for themselves, but for their family members and, and for future generations, not just now. And so that provides a pathway for them to succeed and provide a foundation for them to succeed. But then I'm, again, I am interested in that kind of moral dilemma. How do you, how do you, how do you, go on every day being in conflict. And so I, I was interested in like creating these works that were um, kind of like talking points and dialogue points for uh, these exhibitions. And these are like very much rooted in real people. Like the, the one in the center is actually the father of a student here at the University of Arizona. He is the CBP agent who's Mexican, Mexican-American. And so it is a very real thing um, that I'm seeing like, everywhere, especially of something that I was so in tune with in, in Brownsville. Angel, did you want to mention anything about the type of work that you make? Uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Uh, that's one of the things that, that uh, blows my mind, how many um, Border Patrol agents are Mexican-Americans. Um, a lot of the work that I'm, I've been making, uh, one of the pieces that's in the book uh, was about the, uh, the children being taken from their parents uh, and then put in the tender care detention center, um, which is a terrible name for a detention center, trying to make it sound cute. And yet mm. this is where they're putting children in cages. Um, and so I don't know if a lot of people know, but in 2020, well, when, when Trump lost to Biden, the day after the election is when they put all the cortina wire over our fences here in El Paso. Um, that very next day, we suddenly had spools of razor wire all over the top of our, our border fence. Um, yeah. And I, I remember this because I, I lived very close, I lived very close to the, the fence. 
So as I was going to go see my parents, I was like, wait a minute, what are those guys doing? And they were putting all the rolls up. Uh, but a lot of the work that I've been doing has been made to talk about these issues to people that don't understand what it's like to live like on the border. And uh, like one of the pieces that I made, which is when I met Deanna uh, at the uh, border biennial in El Paso in 2013, was when I was making my playground pieces, you know, and I had a full scale playground uh, that was wrapped in chain link, uh, barbed wire, floodlights and cameras. And, and really it was me talking about how playgrounds in themselves to me were very much uh, a metaphor for the borderlands to me uh, because growing up here, it was very easy to interact with people from different cultures because you go from one country to the other just as, as fluidly and, and people came back and forth and it was, it was a normal thing to just go to the Mercado one day, come back home and, and, and interact with family, go to family on the other side. Um, but, but that one was particular to me because my, my grandma who grew up in Sunland Park, New Mexico would walk us out to the mountains in, by Mount Cristo Rey. And she would walk us to this little canyon where we would see little kids and we'd start playing with them. And they were our friends. It never occurred to me that none of these kids spoke English. It was like, we were all just speaking Spanish there. And I didn't realize that my grandma was walking us into Mexico, you know, and we were just playing, you know, but this was the eighties um, and that can't happen anymore. And it was just tragic to me that in the name of security, they've pretty much shut down what a place was for. So I wanted to take this playground, a place that's supposed to be a place for interaction, learning how to get together, having fun, and you close it off in the name of security and it's rendered useless. Um, and so I've taken it to a lot of places. That's one of the pieces that I've shown consistently since it's been made. Um, it was a little bit too, too, uh, it, it, it did not fit. We did not have the space for and capacity to take it to, to the floor. <laughs> But no, no, it can't I, be even... that it's huge. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's gigantic. But I, I think, yeah. and, and just in, in light of time, you know, to start summarizing and, and have some time for, you know, maybe questions uh, or more questions. This this is, you know, the 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 importance, the drive to create this this collection of work and keep it touring, keep uh keep it moving across America because the artist, they, they are our lived experiences, Angel and, and, and Alex and, and myself have, have gone through. And it's, you know, it's not only that, that pride of place, of, of our unique environment, of our traditions, of our food. And that is, you know, again, whether you are of Mexican American descent or not, I mean, in, in, in my case, some of my family, well, as a mix, you know, as a, as a, women of, of different um, mixes, you know, some some of them, some of the ancestors were already here before it became the United States. So, you know, that it is just this this location and this these stories that go back and these these this the importance of reaching out to these institutions or in the case of the James Museum, that made, you know, that um, the assistant cu curator made contact with me, um, the opportunity to have these platforms to show the work, to generate those thoughts, to, to offer other perspectives on, on the border story, which is, is um, so, such an, such a controversial, such an emotional topic to so many. And, you know, I returned to the, um, the farm workers, um, and what about that moral dilemma? The majority of farm workers are undocumented and grow our food. Regular American citizens with documents do not want to work in those unions, do not want to work in the farms to feed us. You know, it begins with the basics of, of how we eat. 
what we, you know, how we, who, who provides the services to us. And um, so, you know, in the making and, and, and the moving and the creating of, of this body of work, you know, there are so many aspects that begin to, from concept and the areas you want to cover because the border story is so, you know, so, so many facets to it. Um, it's not just these uh, border security and militarization and, you know, and the, 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 there are so many, it's, it's an ongoing story. This, this can go on and on and keep evolving. But what is important that through our, um, the Amarillo Museum of Art, the Las Cruces Museum of Art, all of, you know, we've, we've shown in so many museums now and had such a varied audience and that basic, um, opportunity that allows people to come together and and discuss these matters and see another another viewpoint has been so important and, and so meaningful. I will. Oh, let me. Here's another piece for you to talk about, Alex. I'm yeah. Sorry. So I see it. I think it might be the last one. I'm not entirely sure, but I'll I'll try to provide like a super brief description. This is yes, a painting. It's the yeah. last one. Yeah, so uh, Ascension is the Texas. Yeah, so I cut a lot of my work. I there usually it's you know compositionally divided or it's literally cut, and so the cut acts as a negative space, but it, it is the silhouette of the Rio Grande Valley that separates Texas and Mexico. And uh, I grew up next to the Rio Grande River, and uh, and so I am. I w was interested in the again the icon of the flag and Jasper Johns is obviously like really kind of fueled a lot of that artistic direction, um, and I'm a painter and I was really interested in like particular um, aesthetic choices when it came to painting the flag, but also implementing the Sadape right, and then the Sadape is embedded into the American flag, but it also is reminiscent reminiscent of a border fence uh, as well, right? So there are all these kind of like layered uh, images and iconography over the top of, of itself. I'm also kind of like a casual sneakerhead, right? And so the Jordan one that's implemented in this work, for me, I see as an icon of success. It was, I think that the sneaker that catapulted Michael Jordan to billionaire status and like, and to like, uh, this huge like icon sports beyond sports like a world figure um, that transcended sports and so um, obviously a lot of people come from Me Mexico to reach not only to reach the American dream but also just get by but also like look for success and although I am very very critical of a lot of the policies in the U.S. I understand that I come from a place of privilege. I was born into this country. I understand that I've been able to succeed living in this country. I, I am able to provide for myself and be in a research one institution because I live in this country. And so I think I, I think I speak for many others that we're only just trying to not only survive, but like create again stability for future generations. And so I thought about the sneaker as being this icon of success and not only just wealth, but of, of, of being able to prosper in a country. And so like the, obviously like Michael Jordan was known to like, they call him Air Jordan for a reason. It's almost as if, if he was able to defy physics and fly. And so I'm again, layering all this iconography of like someone jumping, someone going over a fence, but only for the sole reason that they want to succeed and, and persevere and, and get by. And so I have this all this like interweaving iconography um, kind of speaking on migration, but also just my work also, also uh, is able to kind of speak on the there's misconceptions about migration often. And so there's a lot of people that just like want to just live their lives. And 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 sometimes the only way way possible is to be here. And and um and so it, it is like in, interlayered with a lot of 
a lot of those concerns and ideas and and then what's happening in, in the US and so and also a lot of my shared interests and so um um yeah that's pretty much it and I, I think you're you know where where the state of Texas it's it's also like going into that that hiding aspect that conceal ceiling mm -hmm. um that you have to live a hidden life of sorts you know yeah. um and then also your use of color in the red white and blue just yeah you know another yeah. element maybe yeah. um well thank you thank you so much um and here uh this is the the uh the cover of the book and the way this came about i will just share share briefly i was presenting the uh topic um icons and symbols of the borderland at the national historic preservation conference in chicago and um the first person that came up to me was the senior publisher for Schiffer Publishing and inquired if we'd had a, had a book on, on our exhibit um, at that time was, I believe it was, well, it was 2019. And uh, so that that is how, you know, not only the touring exhibit, but speaking about it and, and going out and then sharing the works and as widely as possible generated this other opportunity and the uh, the book is a different platform it includes um it does not it's not a catalog of the exhibit but it includes except you know because it's it's just a different platform in itself but it also won the independent publishers book award uh for um, the Benjamin Franklin Gold for Politics and Current Events. So it is a prime example of, of this, um, you know, collective experience, this, these collective, these, these, you know, united voices with, you know, an array of, of perspectives, meaningful perspectives that, that, uh, you know, features our border and speaks to the important issues of the border. And the book is is uh, also available at the gift shop at the James Museum. And if you want to know more at, at this point, it's you know somewhat of a of a history book, but uh, a living history book as well. You know, we're we're still living through these these uh, borderland stories. Um, I'd like to open it up for for questions now. Uh, from Shu or more Marilyn or uh, thank you Diana and uh, thank you uh, Alice also and your wonderful exhibition I have not gone to the James Museum to see this uh, special ex exhibition but just uh, the right now the topic uh, you know, probably coming back and I was one time I was on the border I went to Arizona so I do see how the uh, the border and the private, which is the uh, you know, border controls uh, what they need to deal with. So I do understand the complexity, the the images, uh, the stories, uh, and all kind of things that put it out. And it, it's a very fascinating exhibit, a lot of work and wonderful work you, you guys had done. So I def definitely this this exhibition will travel and the people to know the your concern and the problems uh, and then will spread out the ideas uh, help people to support what need to be uh, what the, what kind of work need to be done i just have a question I want to ask uh, alice about I, I really kind of, his work have a sense of humor, also the mystery. And this uh, <laughs> kind of interesting, this uh, the taco image, and you have uh, these eyes uh, coming out. Did you have uh, other ideas besides uh, for eyeball to jump out, uh, you know, kind of uh, really uh, seeing such a tasty tacos? Do you have <laughs> other conceptual ideas? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. You know, I haven't thought about it further, but I, you know, I was like, when I made the, the drawing, I was like, how do I capture that feeling? And I, and I couldn't help but think about it, about 
rendering it in a very exaggerated way. And I, so Robert Crom stood to my mind um, and, and, and implemented some sort of like uh, illustrative quality that I felt was a more kind of accurate depiction of my, my feelings at the time. But I don't, I don't, you know, I haven't thought about like re conceptualizing that I and how I would do it differently but man that's a really good question um yeah I don't know I would have to think about that I think those the eye popping expression you just can't beat that I, yeah I, I mean it's pretty accurate like you're not seeing it physically <laughs> yeah. but like I'm feeling it you know and and especially like in a you know uh drunken state you know you just it's it feels like it's again, then you're like transcending and you're like leaving your body. And it's just like, unlike any other feeling. I mean, and those, I recommend going, traveling to the Texas border and eating some te Texas, uh, some tacos if you're ever in the area. Yes. And an invitation to, to come and, and experience the, the fine cuisine and, and um, cultural richness and beauty of the environment and natural national parks and landscapes and um I do want to that's, that's, say, that's the roots of go ahead yeah I, I will say that I want to make more work like it I just haven't had the opportunity to do it I, I do want to make more work, work that kind of illustrates that particular feeling and I want to extend it I just haven't had the opportunity to do it well, I encourage it for one. Okay, thank you. It'd be great to great to see more, and especially with the food related. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, and and I mean, uh, border food, Tex-Mex food, Mexican food is so vibrant and rich, and so I there's a number of drawings that I could do, uh, kind of in related in relation to that. Well, we look forward to seeing that. Carolyn, do you have any any questions or anything you'd like to? Yeah. Uh, no particular questions right now. I'm just overall, you know, overall, just very excited to go see the exhibit myself now that having all this um, kind of behind the scenes knowledge. Um, and I just wanted to thank you all for sharing kind of your experiences and taking us along this journey of how this kind of came to be, especially, you know, uh, the way that you shared kind of the historical points um, over the past years that this exhibit has been kind of growing, um, how each kind of event has shaped the different pieces and how they've all come together to kind of give that um, rich look at all the different icons and, and symbols that you talked about. So I just wanted to thank you again for your insights and, and kind of this peek behind the curtain of everything that that um, that you've shared tonight. So thank you um, for taking the time to be with us here tonight. Well, thank you so much for hosting us. The, the exhibit is showing at the James Museum until January 19th. Uh, we will be there on January 7th, if all goes well, um, for a film screening, because we also have a variety of films um, with, with our uh, filmmaker members. Um, one of them will be a documentary on the life and art of Cesar Martinez, um, as well, that, that is a, a work in progress. And then on the ninth, we will have a, a panel discussion where Angel, Alex, and I will also be present, and um, and also the Melissa Malpignano. She's actually um, a professor of dance at the University of Texas El Paso, and she will have um, uh, a somatic dance movement. Um, at that on that same date on January 9th. So uh, I hope you will spread the word and and uh, see the exhibit and and share it to all the members of the Arts Alliance. And um, thank you so much for hosting us. Thank you so much. I appreciate your all everyone's time.
Thank you so much. It's a wonderful work and presentation. Okay, see you very soon. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you.